Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome along to Beyond Bitcoin, a show predominantly about all things crypto, uh, not focused on Bitcoin, but nonetheless, we do include it. Along with me today, like normal, is my friend and colleague, Nitin Gower. Hello, Nitin. Hey, Derek. Uh, really glad to be here. This time, I'm calling in from Palau. As you know, I have interesting travel experiences and looking forward to, again, an amazing conversation about Latin America. So we are truly going global here. Uh, you being in Australia, me being in Palau, and we have a guest today from, uh, from Latin America. We do indeed, Martin Hegelstrom. And thank you so much for coming to join us from Latin America. Um, and I'd like you to you know, maybe give a background to Martin because you've worked with him for so many years, yeah. Nitin, and you, know, you both know each other so well. Um, so over to you. Thank you, uh, Derek. So, you know, you know, one thing I'm, I'm really glad about is having Martin on the show. One, because Martin is on the ground. He's, he actually is leading our entire Latin America effort, you know, efforts for IBM in terms of blockchain leadership, which spans from Mexico all the way down to, to Chile. And as you know, like, you know, the typical Latin American classification is the Spanish speaking South America and Brazil, which is Portuguese speaking. And that's how we sort of break up. But, and, and, and Martin has been in this space with me for the past eight years when I was leading the global sort of initiatives in, in spreading the word for the enterprise perspective. And I met Martin and Martin was passionate back in the day as a Bitcoin enthusiast. And we brought him into the leadership and he was, has been driving ever since the, the message as well as the technical design, understanding the, uh, you know, the, uh, the space, not just from enterprise perspective, but also from the typical crypto perspective. And I think looking forward to him sharing with us his rich experience that he's, he's accumulated over time and, and me and him chat quite a bit, not just from a client perspective, but also from an industry trend perspective. So again, Martin, welcome to our show and uh, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, great to have you on the show and tell us a little bit more about you and what shapes your experience in, in, this, you know, in this industry. Okay, thank you. Hi guys, thank you for having me. Um, as you said, my name is Martin Hagerstrom. I live in Chile. I'm actually from Argentina, but I've, living, I've been living in Chile for the past 13 years. Uh, so I've uh, been in the space since 2012 or 2013, early 2013. It was kind of for an accident. I, I had a website at that time, uh, a small website. And I offer a subscription service and I use PayPal at that time. Um, PayPal uh, uh, one day limited my account. That's their polite way to say that they closed my account and they freeze my phone for six months. Um, I had to start looking for alternatives and this was late 2012 and I found Bitcoin at that time. And I thought that was a stupid idea uh, trying to convince my clients to, to learn about a new currency. Uh, it was, at that time, it was really hard to use. Uh, and I, I left it there and then I look at a, a viable alternative for my, way, for my website at that time. But uh, in, in early 2013, it, it, Bitcoin had a spike in the price and I started reading again about it. And, since then, I've been reading and I've been involved in this space, uh, I guess, almost every day. So and that's how I started in this space. That's my story on, on how, I get, how I got here. Well, I noticed, uh, uh, Martin, you're, you're quite a commentator because looking online, you're in dozens of conferences and videos and, and blogs. And, and so you, you're clearly a narrator to this space. Um, and that's what we're hoping to sort of get some feedback today, because what we've noticed when, we, when we've looked into different countries and we've looked at how the countries and the cultures utilize digital assets and digital currencies, we notice they reflect differently. They're literally using these assets and currencies in different way, depending on what their culture is and depending on what their political and economic challenges or advantages are. Mm -hmm. and, and what's amazing about South America is that you guys are dominantly large. So let's just have a look at it. We often discuss the fact that the developing countries are putting a great deal of the money in this and are doing a great deal of the investment in this space. But one has to ask the question about who are the users? And we've spoken about this before. 
the top 20 users in this space are Vietnam, India, Pakistan, Ukraine, Kenya, Nigeria. I mean, you kind of think the top 20 in this space would be America, UK, Australia, Singapore. It's not. Um, but what's extraordinary is that number seven is Venezuela, number 10 is Argentina, number 11 is Colombia. So this is resulting in, according to the stats from, from Coindance, um, this is resulting in you guys having around just under a 16% um, holding of all Bitcoins that have been minted. Um, these are extraordinary numbers. Why do you see this happening? Why are the South Americans, many different countries, of course, so I'm very sorry to, to put it into a generalized statement like that, um, enthusiastic about uh, adopting this space and these currencies? Yeah, uh, I guess I will start by, by talking about Argentina. It's my country, it's the, the, the place that I know the most. Uh, mm. I don't know if you guys know the history of economic history of Argentina, but it's a mess. It's it's, it's a mess. Uh, we have a history of capital controls. We have a history of inflation. Uh, lo lots of different currencies that we take zeros and we start all over again. And we uh, every ten years we have a crisis and we have the same kind of story. We have something that's called the corralito. That it's that it's that the 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 they told the banks that we couldn't take our money out. So, so uh, uh, kind of a haircut of our. Uh, so, so uh, we have a history. It's not. It's not like the past ten or twenty years. Is uh, I guess the past sixty years or seventy years that uh, every generation has passed for one of the has passed on one of these crises. So. People just don't trust on banks. People just don't trust on local currencies. People in Argentina uh, saves in dollars, in US dollars, uh, historically, and not in banks. You 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 take the money at home and you keep it under the under under your mattress. That's that's kind mm. of the so. Mm. Uh, and big transactions are are all made in cash. You you go and buy a a, a home a, a house. You, you don't get a mortgage that doesn't exist. You go and pay in cash. And maybe you can use a bank and, and you, you use a bank only to use their security and to use the bank to count the, the, the bills. It's not that you use the bank for a financial service. So, so it's, it's really different from what you see in Australia and you see in the US. So, so we, are, we, are, we are used to this. So when you think in something like that, like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, that you have uh, sensors, sensors your system, is the, the value proposition is really, really is, is this kind of that it was thought to uh, to 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 apply in this kind of in this kind of situation. So uh, people make sense of cryptocurrencies uh, very very. It's, it's really easy to understand what's the value proposition of Bitcoin uh, for a guy in Argentina. So. Uh, people start saving in these currencies. People start using it. You see uh, real estate transactions uh, being done in stable coins, being done in Bitcoin. Um, we have we have lots of uh, exchanges. We have wallets. We have everything in the space. Is, is, is there's a, a really big, really 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 big ecosystem? I, I'm one of the administrators of a of a Facebook group that is a, a it's the biggest Spanish speaking uh, Bitcoin group. It's not really about Bitcoin. It's, it's called Bitcoin Argentina, but it's it's all about cryptocurrencies now. Uh, it was it was founded in 2013 or 14. I don't remember. And now it has like 75,000 members. So it's it's really huge. Mm -hmm. It's really really huge. And and well, uh, people use cryptocurrency in the in in their in, in everyday transactions. You 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 see it in everyday. Uh, and that's Argentina. Uh, Colombia has something similar. But uh, their regulators are are are, are working with uh, they, they create a sandbox a, a regulatory sandbox for banks to be able to work with exchange so people can use their banks to get cryptocurrencies so uh, there are this kind of a different reality uh, there are countries like Chile where I actually live where the banking system is really really good people trust in banks so adoption is not that big. 
people use cryptocurrencies just for remittances. So if you have someone living in Venezuela or, or, or some, someone from your family living in Colombia, you send money uh, using cryptocurrencies. But if not, you don't use it in, every, in your everyday life. Uh, but I, I guess that that's kind of a, a good summary that you, you see different uh, realities in different countries and it's, it's based on the, the, the history, the economic history. Yes. Right. And so, you know, the one thing that strikes out, uh, you know, actually stands out, Martin, is that if you look at Argentina, which has gone through cycles of hyperinflation, as you mentioned, going back and resetting the currencies, you know, robbing people off their savings and wealth and this, you know, Carlito, which you mentioned, which is like a haircut and saying you can have access to your funds, sort of, you know, in many cases is is infringing on people's rights to be able to save and you sort of lose faith in, in, in those elements. But besides the obviousness of that introduction of cryptocurrency, which says, you know, I'm going to be in charge of my own financial system. There's no government that can take it away. It's a truly global system driven by global demand and supply and has a generic sort of appreciation built into it as not just a medium of exchange, but store of value, right? Which is what I think we have seen in, in, in the context. But more importantly, I think that it's not just fueling the adoption of cryptocurrency in this space, but also a massive amount of interest from the youth. Uh, technical, I've seen amazing startup companies evolve and build amazing projects on Ethereum because they see this as an avenue to say, look, I can't go work for a bank or I cannot go work for a government agencies because of obvious inability for me to be able to earn a decent living and have a good quality of life. Why don't we just go and plug myself into this sort of a global nation state concept? And I think Derek and me had a session on this in comparing Bitcoin and Ethereum as, as, you, know, as uh, you know, having a governance mechanism to nation states and how it's attracting the digital natives. And I believe that it's not just from Argentina, but you see that from Paraguay, you see that from many of the emerging economies is attracting the digital natives as digital citizens of these you know, ecosystems like Ethereum and Bitcoin. And so I think that is something which to me is much more as a technical guy, it's much more attractive to see amazing amount of talent coming in without having to worry about visas and without having to worry about being able to move to a country to say, you know, I can sit here and innovate and get paid at a global scale without actually having to move to a country and have a geographical advantage, which I think is a very uplifting element. But if I look at the continent as in preparation for this call, I look at Venezuela, which has some similarities, and I look at El Salvador, Par, you know, Paraguay, uh, you know, Argentina or, or Argentina, I look at this from three aspects. One is the economic aspect, which I think we talked about and love to get your perspective. I look at energy perspective, which is what, you know, El Salvador is making these ambitious plans and trying to tap into volcanoes and having been traveled to South America extensively, I think South America has its, its great share of volcanoes and love to see what does that equation look like because energy and infrastructure is still a challenge in some of these countries to be able to attract, uh, you know, and, and with the talent. And second thing is regulatory framework. I think besides Brazil, at least in my opinion, I don't think any other country has that much more and Brazil has ETFs and some other you know, areas around and they're doing some work on CBDC. And me and you have worked with you know, Bolsa de Santiago in Chile on some of these projects. So I'd love to get on these three perspectives. Is the, is, is the diversity of South American continent, is that in, in line with the other aspects of unification with language or unification with cultural uh, elements? Or you see pockets of innovation, pockets of this driven by necessity, driven by political motivations and so on and so forth. I know it's a loaded question, but I figured I'll just throw it out there. Yeah, sure. I don't know if it's there. There is something that is Latin America grassroots uh, so kind of kind of ecosystem. I, I think it uh, the, the origin is the, the, the yeah the, the the origin is each country created their own community. So you see the Argentinian community, the Chilean community, the Brazilian community, a, a very uh, a big community in, in Colombia, and Venezuela, uh, and Mexico too. But but all, all the communities start work have started to work together. So a, a few weeks ago there was a, a conference that is called La Bitconf, Latin American Bitcoin Conference. Uh, I've been in a fair amount of conference uh, by now, and I think that La Bitconf is the best conference, the best conference that uh, on the space. Um, I've been conferences that are much bigger, the, the ones in New York, the ones in Miami, and, and but this one is really, really good. And, and it's a, a, a conference where speakers go because they really have fun and everyone likes, loves to go. And the community there is great. And, and 
It started in Argentina. The first one was in Argentina, but we have a bit conf in, in, in Chile, in Colombia, in Uruguay, in Brazil, and the last one was in Salvador. Uh, and it was great. The, the, it, it was great. Everybody, everybody was there. Everybody was there, and it was kind of the 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 the, the, the Bitcoin weave on on Salvador, and it was really, really, really huge. And there you see the the amount of people that is working on this all over the continent, and now they're working together. The, 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 there are several great projects. You you talk about startups, and you talk about the the talent that you see here. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Jack Dorsey and the, the, all these guys have been uh, has been uh, recommending a Bitcoin wallet that is called a Lightning wallet that is called Moon. That that yeah. one is that one is a small startup from Argentina, or at least it started yeah. a small startup in Argentina. Mm -hmm. I, I know that Io, one of the founders, is a great guy, and it's, uh, and and. Uh, there are several uh, DeFi projects on Ethereum or Rooftop, RSK, that it's this side chain on the Bitcoin, uh, this kind of Ethereum fork that is a side chain on the Bitcoin network um, bringing smart contracts to Bitcoin. So there are a lot of projects that are really, really interesting uh, that, that are uh, being worked in Latin America. And it's not, not, it's not in a particular country. You see, and you mentioned also the thing about energy, and, and you have places like Salvador or, or places where you you have uh, cheap renewable energies, but also you have what this kind of governance brings that are like Venezuela, like Argentina, that energy is subsidized. So uh, there is an arbitrage, a, po a possible arbitrage. Right? So, so there's a lot of people mining over in, in Argentina. There's a lot of people mining in Venezuela uh, and, and not, not large operations, not really large operations, but, pe but people doing some money. And that's because uh, energy over here, not, I'm not saying in Chile, and Chile is expensive, but in, Ar in Argentina and in Venezuela, it's really, really cheap. So uh, if, if you, you get cheap energy, you can, you can have, you can make a living over there. So that's, that's also what you see, but that's not because energy should be cheap over there, but it's because energy is cheap because it's subsidized by the government. By the government. So um, can I also ask, is these, these, this development that you're seeing happen here? And as you say, the, the conferences in South America uh, you know, are outstanding. And, and if you look into that space, there are so many developers doing such great work. Um, is the development really um, trying to be focused on global products for the generation of, of global wealth, you know, to come into to, to, to South America, depending on which country it's in? Um, or are a lot of the developments specific to the requirements that we're seeing in each country in South America? Uh, how, how are they looking at it from a perspective of saying we need a tool here um, or from the perspective of saying we want to have a global product? No, good, good question. I think we have both. Uh, I, I've been testing a, 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 a product that's called Velo. It's, it's only available in Argentina now. And that one is something that is, at least for now, very specific for Argentina. Because what you get there is financial services that people just usually get from banks. Uh, so you can invest your money, you can have savings, you can... Uh, so you can get uh, stable coins or the amount of dollars that you, you want in your bank. You can only get $200 per month, but here you can get the amount of stable coins that you want. You can only, you, you can invest them and you get some yield. So, so it's really specific for, for mm. the kind of services, the financial services that people from Argentina just can get. So, and, and as Nitin said before, the youth, especially youth, so it's a simple wallet, and that one is very specific for Argentina. But I will say that most of the projects are global. The most of the projects are, are projects that you probably know from, from, from DeFi, from the DeFi space. Most of the big projects have people from Argentina working from Argentina, or working from Colombia, or working from all over uh, Latin America. I will mention uh, Uniswap, Bancor, uh, all, all the... Maker DAO, Maker, all, all those, all those ones have a, a lot of people working from from Latin America. So I guess it's both. 
but most of the projects are, are global. But we bring, we probably bring the perspective of why this is needed. Uh, I always say that it's much more easier to explain why cryptocurrencies are needed, what the value proposition is to, to people from here than people from the developed countries. Uh, when you trust on your financial system where your financial system works, it's, it's harder to get the point. Uh, but when you know what, uh, what is the value to get the custody of your, of your, of your assets yourself, you, you, and, and, and nobody can come and take it, and nobody can say the amount of money you can transfer to another people, or if you can transfer it to your family based in another country, yes. there, there it's easier to see the value. Yes, okay. exactly. so, so one thing on this, right, talking about, again, the context in Colombia and, and Argentina and Venezuela, where I think in many cases, the system has failed the people, as, as we have seen this over and over again, as you described, as we read in media, as we have experienced this in, in our travels. Does regulation matter in the sense that, you know, yes, there's a capital outflow regulation now, there's all kinds of other regulations in terms of use of dollar or outflow of dollars because dollar becomes the global currency of sorts. And, you know, in our, in the U.S. context, we have talked to this in stablecoin context to say, hey, if countries are imposing the restrictions in terms of how much money you can take in and take out, doesn't stablecoins and some of this, you know, which is our way of telling the U.S. system to say, it's an opportunity for us to lead and maintain dollar dominance if stablecoin becomes a global currency of sorts that people begin to have exactly what you have mentioned. People would like to maintain the uh, you know the uh, the currency maybe not in mattress but maybe in a secure wallet so to speak. Mm. Uh, so from that perspective, I'm just wondering: Does regulation matter? Because it has regulations historically has failed people. And uh, and second thing is that even if they have a regulation, it could not be self-serving. Yeah. I think that regulation matters, and and. But because regulation can facilitate things or can make things harder. So for, for getting more adoption, I won't say that it's necessary to have the proper regulation. But if you have, if you ban cryptocurrencies, for example, exchanges that connect you to the financial system cannot work. You need to plug into the actual financial system to be able to take the amount of pesos that I have in my account and buy some cryptocurrencies. And, and that kind of stuff, it's harder to do if regulation is not, is not there. But I don't think that regulation should do or should cover a lot. Should be clear, should be small, and should let, let this keep the you know, goals. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what, what the proper way would, uh, pro proper word would be, but I, I think that the, take out the, ups, the obstacles. For example, okay. uh, in Chile, regulation is really simple and it only talk about taxes. The truth is it only, it only talk about how to tax the thing. I think it's good because people has a, a clarity that this is legal. This can be but it's you know how to pay your taxes with this so so yeah and it doesn't cover all of, all the other stuff and it it, just, it doesn't need to have a, a specific regulation because of this kind of asset so uh, i think that that's yeah, it should be simple yeah and and i and i really agree to that i think what i'm referring to is as, as what we have explored in the us context is around regulatory arbitrage which is you find gaps mm -hmm. in different jurisdictions and people who understand the space are taking advantage of these gaps uh, and in some cases, the regulation is still catching up with technology because you have so many asset classes and you have an exchange that's, for example, giving you stable coins and letting you exchange commodities, securities, and NFTs. And historically, I think exchanges were only doing with securities and you have commodities exchanges and you have different sort of, which are regulated differently. And the thing is that the confusion and ability for the, the system, the financial system and the regulatory apparatus that governs the financial systems I think just creates more challenges than helping the community grow. And the clarity is important, yeah. which means that let's have less intervention, but we do need to have some framework as we, as we who work with the financial industry in general would need to have the clarity to say, we need to have some framework that protects people. But my question then becomes that, is that now, you know, given the fact that the history of some of these countries who are involved, Venezuela is a perfect example, what regulation will they do? And will that be in the best interest of people? Uh, so that's something which I think we have debated to say if Venezuela has a reg regulation and these are global networks and let's say Argentina has a regulation, uh, can, because of the proximity and because of the cultural 
affinity in, in Latin America, which is much closer than many other parts of the world, uh, is there a premise of taking advantage of that regulatory arbitrage, which is the gaps between the regulatory agencies, because these are smaller countries, they have, they have very uh, volatile sort of political climates and people change oftentimes. Uh, doesn't that, or do people really care about that anymore? Because like, hey, I just need to, as you mentioned, remittances, I need to store value. And love to get your thoughts on that. And second thing I would like to know if 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 this proverbial storage of money under mattress is is universal, isn't that like a thing for the thieves? They hey, let me just hit the mattress, because if everybody's storing the money on the mattress, and we have been giving this example for ages, they got to find new places to hide the money. I think. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, I, I will take that last question first. The, the money on the mattress is really a thing. It's not something figurative. And, and you, you will find money on the mattress. You can find money on a bag uh, in, in your garden. But also, for example, a, a big business for banks is to offer safe uh, deposit, safe deposit. How, how's the, what, what are they called? Um, yeah, uh, safe deposit box. Safe box. Mm, yeah. yeah, safe deposit box. Every bank uh, has lots and lots and lots of them because people just in deposit the money on the bank, they go to the bank and, and use that kind of boxes. So, so, so yeah, it, it's, it's dangerous to have one year on your, on your, on your house, but when you assess the risk, people choose that all over to giving access to their money to, to banks and government. So that, that says a lot. On the other hand, in, in terms of arbitrage between countries and regulatory, um, I guess for for startups and for yes, and you see it when when for the DeFi projects they don't want to the burden of, of having to to comply with U.S. regulation and you the the DeFi uh, on their website they say we don't we don't attend uh, U.S. citizens or U.S. U.S. persons so so you you see that all the time even you don't have to identify there is no KYC or no nothing but they don't need the burden of that so so the, that, there is that arbitrage. But in particular in Latin America, moving money is really hard, at least on the finance, on the traditional financial system. You have capital controls and where you don't have capital controls, you have really expensive ways of moving money. So I guess you see these arbitrage in terms of, well, I, I will hire the people from different countries. I don't need to be in a particular place. We, we where our users will be where we were not not in our own country but where we we think is better for our market but i guess it's still it's still early and 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 we will see how it, this all this develop uh, there are kind of a couple of markets that are really really big i've been talking a, a lot about argentina colombia venezuela but brazil is huge uh, there is a a really huge market inside brazil uh, and and it's kind of a completely different story there we will we see a lot of not not only on the on the crypto space but on the blockchain space on the on the enterprise space where where on my day job let's say uh, i see a lot of adoptions uh, uh, banks are, are adopting on supply chains are adopting it and, and now we see the combinations of supply chains and banks on on, on the same network so brazil mexico also is a huge huge uh, huge market where you have uh, yeah, a massive opportunity. So Martin, um, you know, you're in, immersed in the space. You're fortunate enough to be you know, committee members of the largest associations in South America. Um, you get a sense of how these nations are working separately and together. You understand some of their cultures, from, no doubt all of their cultures. Uh, and what we often try to determine is where is all this going? And where is, is it going to end up over the next five to 10 years? Now, it's a very challenging question. And the reason why is that nothing's lineal in this space. There is no, well, this is how it is now. And we can multiply that by 10x. And that's where it will be in X number of years. But the groundswell that you're seeing getting created in the various South American countries, where do you think that's going to um, where do you think that's going to go in regards to politics, in regards to people's self-actuation of control of their funds, and in regards to commerce? Um, what are your thoughts there over the next five years? If you think 10 years, that's great, but in the next five years at least. 10 years is kind of a lifetime for, for this space. So uh, <laughs> yes. I, I would say I really don't know for 10 years. I really, really don't know. But 
What I would guess is that we will continue seeing innovation on an efficiencies that will bring more commerce. Uh, today, we see uh, this as a, as, a, as a store of value, but we will see more and more commerce going on using not only uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, but also uh, stable coins. Lots, I, 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 I'm already seeing real estate operations using stable coins because Taking a bag with a lot of cash, it's very insecure. <laughs> and if you can go and send money using a hardware wallet or your cell phone, that's that's a more much more efficient operation. And when you see Lightning Network, when you see other 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 kind of innovations that are going on now, and it's getting easier to to use. But there, I think there, there is the the challenge. We have lots of very good technical people. Uh, work on the protocol level, working on the the central finance, creating new protocol, creating new governance models. But it's really hard to use yet. They, it, we need more product people, more people that that you started saying that I talk a lot in conferences. I, I used to write in CoinDesk. That was a very long time ago. And when I go back and read those articles again, I. I still think that the things that I was saying in 2015 or 16 are still valid today. We need people that know more about the UX, know more about product. And we don't know, we, we, when you buy a television, you don't want to understand how the television works. You just mm. want to see your shows. And here it's exactly the same. When uh, there is some kind of users that like to understand how all this thing works, but if we want to get massive adoption, we need to give, the, give them the thing already working and we need to work on the products that people can use yes. without really knowing what's going on on, on, on the backstage. So uh, I think that there will, there will be a lot of uh, innovation in that, in that space in order to get that adoption. So this is, uh, I think this is a challenge worldwide. But what I'm hearing from your discussion and your, your deep understanding of that in, in of those countries is that the challenge for them to adopt cryptocurrency is less than those in developed countries. Um, I used an example just recently. A senior member of the Reserve Bank of Australia um, came out with an official statement, uh, went into the newspapers, that once um, should the Reserve Bank of Australia issue a central bank digital currency, there will be no need for any other cryptocurrencies. And I thought that was the most profoundly ignorant statement. I was gobsmacked. I had to read it three times to see whether he really meant that. And so, so what that shows you is when you're deeply entrenched in the system, the system is the only thing that exists and anything else represents a conundrum. What we're hearing from you is that the systems don't overly work well. And so the openness and, re and reception to the to the um, users is, is much greater. They look at it and say, I understand this. I get custody. I get control of my assets. That's what I want. This is simple. And we're often seeing developed countries going, this is complex. I don't understand this. Why, don't, why isn't my bank involved with the transaction? And so I think you've got a great advantage there. And at the end of the day, as I, we've often said along the way, Nitin and I, and that is that um, these things are belief systems. What we're creating is a whole lot of digital assets and digital currencies that are operating in a whole variety of belief systems. And the belief system where you're from, you know, from, from Colombia and, and, and Venezuela and Peru, Chile, Mexico, they're all slightly different, no doubt. But those belief systems say we need stability, we need control of our assets, and we need to be empowered. And I think that's exciting. I will add to that that when you need something, you are willing to invest time in learning or, or doing something that is not really comfortable, but you, because you need it. Uh, okay. If you don't see the need, maybe you don't do that extra step or take the risk of doing something new. So that comes in our favor too, I guess. That's right. Like the gentleman from sure. Reserve Bank. Yeah. Um, so, so look, thank you very much indeed for joining us, Martin. Greatly appreciate you inviting Martin along, Nitin. Um, and sharing this perspective um, of another continent and another way and another interpretation of how digital assets are, are earned. 
if you want to connect with Martin, uh, it's Martin Hagelstrom, H-A-G-E-L-S-T-R-O-M, you can see, um, and you'll find him on LinkedIn um, along the way. In fact, you'll find him right throughout the internet. You just type his name in. Um, <laughs> and look forward to seeing you again in a week's time, Nitin, and for our next topic, which I think is another country. Thank you very That's much. That's true. And, and uh, thank you so much, Derek. And, and Martin, again, thank you for your time, your expertise, and above all, your friendship over the years. Uh, really glad to have your show. And I think I enjoyed this conversation very much. We could go for hours, as we oftentimes say. But uh, again, looking forward to you know working with you and continuing to working with you in this space. And uh, thanks so much. And you have a good, you know, good day ahead of you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for having me.